Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin. Amma ba'd I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that his beloved Nabi and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and final messenger. It's indeed a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us and chosen us to be seated seated inside the masjid at this given time. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he subhanahu wa ta'ala make these moments beneficial for every single one of us. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. I'm reminded of an ayah that we recite regularly and if we don't we should be reciting regularly. It's from Surah Al-Mulk in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the end mentions قُلْ هُوَ الَّذِي ذَرَأَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَإِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهُ وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينَ And then the, the, the subject matter continues, it doesn't end there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to certain individuals, the disbelievers, who would come to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask him, you know this day that you're talking about, this day that you always talk about, that you mention in your lectures and your, you remind us of when is this day, right? When will this day occur? When will we be, you talk about the, the hashr, the resurrection, the return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When will this return occur? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were verses that were revealed and the question was, وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ If you're truthful, then where is this promise that you always talk to us about? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, قُلْ سَيْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ The knowledge of this day is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينٌ As far as myself, my job is to warn. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was one who warned and Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was one who gave glad tidings. And ever since I've arrived yesterday, we have been discussing during the khutbah yesterday, during the evening session yesterday, death, the day of judgment. And we mentioned and multiple individuals mentioned that we hope and anticipate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we happen to fall into a number of these categories. Right, in this hadith, سَبْعَةٌ يُذِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّهُ On the day on which there will be no shade except the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are seven categories of individuals and as Imam Dhiya has reminded us that there's a possibility that there are other categories as well. There's many other, though the, as, as Sheikh Yasir was mentioning, umbrellas. Right, just imagine, you know when we go for Umrah. Right, when we go for Umrah or Hajj, especially if you happen to be there in the summer um, and you happen to be in the courtyard outside, you haven't made it into the haram on time, you're running late and there's these umbrellas outside. Right? And everyone tries to squeeze in the umbrella because the sun, it's the hot sun on one's head. And everyone started, in fact, when the rows finish at the umbrella, although there may be room, people don't stand in that row, they go to the next row either in the back or the front because they want to be in the shade on this very, very hot day, right? Come to think of it, in, an, in, a, in a riwayah we are reminded that the Prophet ﷺ says that due to the sin of an individual, that person may actually be drowning in their own perspiration, drowning in their own sweat, right? It's an it's extremely hot day. The sun is right above our heads. People will be worried. There are certain narrations that actually go on to mention that there, the individuals on this day, uh, there's a possibility that they may be naked on the day of judgment. Everyone will be naked. You know, and you would imagine like, wow, you know, you get to see everyone. You won't have time to think. Right? People will be so worried about their reckoning with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they won't have time to think. You know, and, and we know this, when we're extremely worried about something, right? You got a cop behind you, you've been subpoenaed to appear in court for some reason, right? You've, uh, you, you've received a letter, you've been, you've been sued for something, right? You don't, although there's, there's a lot of good things going on in your life, you can't pay attention to those anymore, right? And so people will be so worried about their reckoning. And those individuals whose reckoning has been completed, 
right, whose hisab and their judgment has been completed, they will be overcome with joy. They will be overcome with joy. This is a reality. Right? This is a reality. The day of judgment is a reality. This day is a very long day. This day is a very hot day. And then there are certain categories. And the three that I am to touch on this evening, the first of those three, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A youth, a young individual, shab, nasha'a, who is raised in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a few things that we want to mention here. First, what is a young individual? Who is a young individual? Of course, every individual that spends time in the worship and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an honored individual. If we happen to be in the worship and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should take glad tidings from Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We've only been created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. Now, again, when we, when we talk about worship, there's the direct acts of worship, and then there's the indirect acts of worship. There's direct acts of worship. You're praying salah, you're fasting, you're giving zakah, you're giving in charity, you're performing hajj, there's direct acts of worship. And then there's indirect acts of worship, where you happen to be helping someone out. It's not necessarily a direct act of worship, but you're, maybe you're guiding someone, you're leading someone, you're showing someone the way, whatever it may be, there's indirect acts of worship. But all of, these, all of these are considered acts of worship. In fact, everything that we do during the course of our day, day in, day out, can become an act of worship as long as we think of it as a worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Going to, you know, you wake up in the morning, you wake up in the morning, we use the bathroom. Most of us hopefully use the bathroom. Yeah, you can smirk, that's okay. You use the bathroom, right? That action in and of itself can become an act of ibadah. Recite the dua before you walk in, walk in with your left foot. Make sure you make your istinjat correctly, make sure you cleanse yourself correctly. As you're performing wudu, we all brush our teeth, right? Get, you know, whatever, your fancy uh, toothbrushes, the ones that you've paid $150 for at Costco, right? I yeah, still haven't seen the point. But whatever it is, you know, people have whatever their fancy. These are, you're, you're brushing your teeth, you're cleansing your mouth. That is an act of worship. If you're doing it with the right intention. Right, coming to the masjid. Going to work. People don't realize this. Going to work is an act of worship. As long as your intent is that with this halal income that I'm going to make, I'm going to feed my family. That this income is a halal. We talk about halal food. People, there's this big discussion in our communities about halal food. And then there, you know, there's people, is this halal? Is this halal? Is this haram? Right? That restaurant is halal. Har Sometimes we don't realize that the essence of the salary that we receive, our paychecks that we receive, may have an essence of haram in them simply because we haven't fulfilled our employer's wishes. Right? When you signed, when you signed, when you, there was a tender, you took the job, you signed a contract, your job requires to do, fulfill certain responsibilities. And when we don't fulfill those responsibilities, the boss doesn't find out, doesn't matter. The boss doesn't care, you know, the boss doesn't find out. You get your paycheck at the end of the month, you're happy. Maybe you're getting your work done, maybe not. Maybe, you know, maybe your boss finds out, maybe they don't find out, whatever it may be. You receive a paycheck. Right? The money was deposited into your bank. That money is not necessarily halal for you if you haven't fulfilled the responsibilities of your employer. Right? If you haven't fulfilled the responsibilities of your employer. And people don't think about this. People really... And then of course, you know, what do you do with that money? Now being very practical here, what do you do with that money? Right? People, are you spending it as the way it should be spent? Are you wasting your money? Right? The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ People who waste their money, people who are extravagant in spending, are the brothers and the sisters of the shaitan. Are you spending your money in the right place? Are you ensuring that the rights of your families have been fulfilled? Are you ensuring that the rights of your community have been fulfilled? 
Or are you taking it all and using, utilizing it all for yourself? Right? So when we talk about ibadah, everything in our life can become an ibadah. A simple trip to Costco can become an act of ibadah. Because when you go, you're bringing food back for the family. You are feeding your family. You are fulfilling, as, as Imam Dhiya mentioned that verse, الرِّجَالُ قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ That it's the responsibility of the men to look after their families. Right? If you go with that intention, right? or the women go with that intention, fulfilling the responsibilities of the household, a simple trip to the supermarket can become an act of worship. As long as you're going in, right? You're thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings. You're walking out, right? Being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Simple things. Simple things. Seeing homeless people, giving a buck or two to them. Right? That's what it comes. So, ibadah. Right? There's, there's a shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A young individual who was raised in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the reasons why Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions young. Is simply because when an individual is young, they have a lot more energy, a lot more time, right? A lot more desire to carry on whatever actions they wish to carry on. You can survive on very little sleep. You don't have to sleep a lot, right? And there's, and there's you know, you have so much potential. Some people utilize that potential for the right reasons. You tell a young individual to stay up till 2, 3 in the morning, they can do so. Right? If you tell them that they're going somewhere, there's a football game, there's a, what is it, a soccer game tomorrow morning? Liverpool versus Manchester United? What time is it? 6 o'clock? 7 o'clock? There's a 49ers game going on right now, that's what I'm interested in. Starts, started 10 minutes ago. Um, but tell someone to wake up at 7 o'clock on a, on a Sunday morning, if it's for a soccer game, or football game as we like to call it in England, uh, if it's for a soccer game, you wake up, but you tell someone to wake up for Salat al-Fajr in the morning, can you? Will you? Where do your interests lie? Where do your priorities lie? And in the midst of all of this, if an individual is conscious enough that they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that you are an individual that should be commended. You are an individual that your actions should be honored. That you should be rewarded that in a day, age, and time when you could have done so much, you did not forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, you had all the fun. I'm not saying don't have fun. Go have fun. Play football, play soccer, go out to eat, do whatever you need to. Right? This is especially a message for the young. Right? Go out. Saturday nights, as long as you're with the right kind of people, you're doing the right things, you're in the right places. No harm, as long as you've prayed your Maghrib, as long as you don't get, go to sleep without having prayed your Salatul Isha, as long as you've woken up for Salat, as long as you ensure that you wake up for Salatul Fajr in the morning, because these are the obligations. That when you're out with your friends, you're out with the right kind of people. You're not doing wrong things, you're not making fun of people. Right? You're no, you don't happen to be in the wrong neighborhoods. These are, these are real things, that, these are real challenges. Real challenges. Right? Shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah. Who's raised in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm going to cover this a little more in a few moments. But another, another thing that, you know, I was mentioning yesterday, during the khutbah if I recall. If an individual can make it through if an individual, I was actually mentioning this during the, 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 the portion that uh, Sheikh Yasser is going to be speaking about. But if an individual can actually make it through college, a young Muslim man or a young Muslim woman, with all that's out there, can make it through college, and they're still pure at the end of that four-year journey, that is a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That is a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a person that's gone through so many challenges. Right? It's a, you're, you're young. You have desires like everyone else, everyone else. There's people around you committing haram. You can see them committing haram. 
If you're in dorms, you can hear them committing haram. Ask any average college going child what they go through during the four years that they go through. And despite that, despite that, you will see the masajid that are close to college campuses filled with students. Despite that, when, a, when an MSA has an event, and this is one thing that we need to be conscious of and we don't realize this, MSAs don't have a lot of money. Okay, Muslim student associations don't have a lot of money. And many a times the local masajid, when the students come to the local masajid, the local masajid don't want to fund the MSAs. That's the only halal outlet that most MSAs have. That's the only thing that they have that brings them close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That keeps them connected to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It becomes our responsibility collectively as a community to support those MSAs. Because when we talk about shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah, a young individual that is raised in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that can be very, very difficult and very, very challenging in the society that we live in. Right? And there's examples from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali radiallahu anhu is a prime example. Ali radiallahu anhu is a prime example, one of the first young individuals to accept Islam. Right? Lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. By the way, Ali radiallahu anhu lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before, before uh, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became a Prophet of Allah. Right? Before revelation, Ali radiallahu anhu was already living there. He was in the right company. He happened to be with the right person. And that's why company is very important. We as parents expect our children to have good company, but a lot of times we don't have good company. Right? We expect our children to do the right things all the time, and many a times we're not doing the right things all the time. Right? We expect our children to not be racist, but they're hearing racist comments all through dinner over dinner table. Right? We expect our children to remain obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they see clearly their parents are disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And then when we tell them, of course when we tell our children, sometimes as they get older, they shoot back at us. And say, hey, you do that wrong, and what do we tell them? Be quiet, you don't understand. Oh, they understand. They understand. So, shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A young individual raised in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why when we see young individuals, no matter what their state may be, as long as they're somehow connected to Islam and Iman, value them, give them credit. Don't turn them away, don't shun them away. You know, I got into a lot of trouble, I, I'll never forget this. Some years ago, I happened to be at a masjid in Detroit, and I won't tell you where, but I was, I was at a masjid in Detroit and there was a QA, and a and uh, one of the individuals in the Q&A asked me and said, what to do, they, had a, they have an indoor, Basketball gym, it's the East Coast, it freezes out there, so they have indoor gyms. And an individual said, what do we do with young teenage boys who come to the masjid in shorts that are above their knees? Um, and, and while the prayer is going on, they don't pray. Right? And the gym is a little ways, it's not like it's connected to, to the masjid, it's two separate buildings, so the noise is not penetrating and so on and so forth. And being the young individual that I think I am, um, and the young individual that was raised here in the United States, I, tell them, I told that individual and I said, listen, as long as they're within the compound of the masjid, playing with Muslim children, to some degree aware of their identity, let them come. And this person actually got into an argument with me, you know, and we had this sort of back and forth. At some point I realized that there's some battles you just don't win and you simply walk away. But that's what it comes down to. We need to continue to encourage and make room in our communities and our societies for our young. If we're not going to do that, they'll go somewhere else and they'll find time, they'll find the space, they'll find the things to do. And that's, how, that's precisely how we're going to lose an entire generation. And that leads me to 
That leads me to the next portion of the hadith that I am speaking about. Rajulun, an individual. So you have this, the, the first person that we spoke about, Imam Ziya spoke about was Imam Adil, a just individual, a just ruler. The second one we spoke about was Shabun Nasha'a fi ibadatillah, a young individual that's raised in the ibadah and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third category of individuals of the seven is Rajulun qalbuhu mu'allakun bil masjid, an individual whose heart is attached to the masjid. Iza kharaja minhu hatta that when he leaves the masjid, his or her heart is attached to the masjid, they long to come back to the masjid, and that longing remains until they come back into the masjid. Right, that this is their place. This is their place to be. And in the United States, as it has been for generations, because when we talk about the role of the masjid, even during the time of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa right, the role of the masjid was to organize, the role of the masjid was to protect, and the role of the masjid was to serve as a spiritual center. Organize, organize the activities of the community, to protect the believing men and women, ensuring that they had a safe place to go to. And finally, it was a place of spiritual activity. Not just religious activity, but spiritual activity. One became close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were gatherings of remembrance and gatherings of dhikr, where people came, became close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the, in the American context, when you go to a church, in many churches, in many denominations, the actual prayer area is referred to as a sanctuary. A sanctuary, a quiet place, a safe place, a non-judgmental place. A place where one can come and sit and not be judged for who they are or what they did. A place where one can cry. A place where one can feel safe. That's what our masajid need to become. Right? That's what our masajid need to become. And let me tell you, if you, if you are older, if you're probably of my age or that age, no matter what's happening at the masjid, I'm going to go to the masjid. You can't stop me from going to the masjid. I've been raised in an environment where I went to the masjid. I've been raised in a family where going to the masjid was regular. It, I've been raised in an environment and a background where I continue to pray. No matter the size of the masjid, no matter whether I had to pray in a dungeon, whether I had to play, pray in the last row, whether I got thrown around because I was a young kid that used to walk into the masjid wearing a t-shirt, it didn't matter. Right, for me, and so that's become a part of my life. I don't care where I go. I walk into a masjid and I pray. But for many, the masjid is a place where they're judged. For many, the masjid is a place where they get shunned all the time. For many, our masajid has, have become a place where there's no room for them. There's really no room for them. Now, of course, I'm not necessarily talking about any specific community, but that is a reality. We don't have room. We still continue in this country to not have room for sisters inside the masajid. We continue to not have room for children inside our masajid. Right? And now, of course, if you're not going to have activities for your children in your masajid, they're going to make noise. Children are supposed to make noise. If children don't make noise, they're not children. If children don't run around and kick a soccer ball around inside the masjid once in a while when no one's around, they're not children. But the point is that we need to ensure, now I'm not encouraging, I'm not encouraging kicking soccer balls around inside the masjid or having a nice game of football inside here. I can play a little bit of tackle football here. Um, that's not the idea. The point is that we, we t you know, as, as organizers, as community organizers, we make our masajid safe havens for everyone that needs to or wants to walk in. You know, I have, I have a friend, um, he happens to, he, he's, he comes from a Muslim background, his wife is Latina, and um, they have two young daughters. And of course the children are young and they're going through what kids naturally go through uh, living in an environment where the father is a practicing Muslim and the mother is not. And so of course there's these challenges, you know, of course, you know, there's sort of a tug of war, which direction to the, do the kids go into? And the children naturally, as children, want to sort of take the easy way out, the, the cool way of doing things in the society that Islam generally may not allow. And so this person came to me one day and you know, he was, he was just had a very heavy heart. 
and said, what do I do? And he brings his children to, to Sunday school and the children, alhamdulillah, do come to Sunday school. And I said to him, listen, you don't realize the value of you bringing your children to Sunday school. It's of amazing value. And the reason behind that is when your daughters come to the masjid, they know that there's a wudu area for women. They know that there's a prayer area for women. They know that they can actually go to the prayer area and pray. Right, and pray. So maybe there may come a time, and this is very real, there usually comes a time during an individual's life, sometime in between, when they sort of go a little their own way, and you know, they become rebellious, rebellious to parents, rebellious to their faith, rebellious to any kind of authority. And it's just, it's a phase. But generally, if the foundation is strong, they have something to come back to. And if we've introduced a good Muslim community to our children, no matter where they go in the world, they will have a community to come to. Right? They will know this is a masjid. There's, I'll tell you a true story. A practicing young Muslim who goes to UC Davis, University of California in Davis. And he said that I did not step foot inside a masjid until the age of 22. And he goes around the, seven, around the age of 17, 18. I became a little conscious of the fact that I was Muslim. You know, some of my Muslim friends were praying that I should be going to the masjid. But he said, I feared going to the masjid. I said, what was your fear? He said, my fear was that if I walked in, someone, because of all the horror stories that I had heard, that I would, um, someone would ask me to say the shahada. And I didn't know the shahada. I wanted to go to the masjid. I wanted to sit inside the masjid. I wanted to know what it felt like when people prayed, but I couldn't do it. And he was a Muslim, born and raised in a Muslim family. I didn't know the shahada and I was so scared that someone may ask me the shahada and that, that they would publicly you know, um, humiliate me and kick me out of the masjid. So I actually didn't go to the masjid. These are true stories. I, I tell you a, a bit of a sad story, maybe a little bit of hu humor in it. A young individual called me or sent me an email uh, some two and a half years ago. And he says that, hey, uh, I'm, um, you know, I'm from India, uh, born raised in India. I, have, I work, I go to school in the United States. He went to school at San Jose State University. And I have accepted Islam on my own through uh, some friends. But I actually fear coming to the masjid. Am I safe inside a masjid? So I replied to him, I said, why, why would you ask something like this? And he said, you know, I know that there's sort of this, uh, you know, the, uh, Pakistanis and Indians don't get along, kind of like Algerians and Moroccans, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, they have this love-hate relationship. And so he says that, you know, I, I fear that maybe, you know, there's Pakistanis inside the masjid and because I'm an Indian, um, you know, they may kick me out or something. Um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a real story. Right? This brother comes to the masjid every day. Um, and he said that, um, <laughs> I replied to him and I said, come on down brother. Our masajid are great places. You know, you don't get judged. You can come right in, you can pray. In fact, we're so darn careless that you could come in, pray and leave and no one even asks you your name. <laughs> Which is kind of sad. Right? Uh, he, mashallah, is a good Muslim. He recently went for Hajj and he told his, he hasn't told his parents that he's become a Muslim. Uh, he actually told his parents that he was going on a camping trip and there would be no telephone reception. <laughs> I, I tell you, as funny as it sounds, just imagine. Just imagine. He says, I can't, he goes, I just can't break my parents' heart at this point. He just can't do it. He just doesn't have the courage to do it. He makes dua for them every day. Right? He makes dua for them every day. He would cry like a baby in Hajj. Cry like a baby in Hajj. That's it, you know, and he would he'd just, you know, he'd, he'd say, may Allah bring them to Islam. He just couldn't tell them. He, I mean, just imagine, you're going for Hajj. You know, we all go for Hajj, we're excited. We tell our families, friends, I'm going for Hajj, I'm excited. He couldn't tell anyone. Except for the new friends that he had made at the masjid. The only friends that he has today are the ones he made at the masjid. That is, that's the role of the masjid right there. Right? Especially in the United States where many of us don't have any family or friends. Our family and friends are people at the masjid. Right? That's what it comes down to. The masjid plays a great role. That's why this hadith, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسْجِد A person whose heart is attached to the masjid. Right? That when they, they're in the worship, in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're in a dars, they're in a gathering, that when they leave from it, they feel that that is my place to be. This attachment to the masjid, this love for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
right? We can build all the buildings that we want, but if we don't build that spiritual infrastructure, there's nothing that's going to happen inside these buildings in a few years. And if you want to see real examples of this, go to countries that used to be Muslim. I spent a summer in Spain two years ago. I cried. There wasn't a day in which I wouldn't cry. Not my eyes, but my heart. And I did a lot of driving. I was in, I was in the middle of nowhere in southern Spain for three weeks. Literally in the middle of nowhere. No phone reception, no internet. I was there for three weeks. And on occasion, I'd actually have to leave town. Um, I flew back to London back and forth a few times. And I would go out and, you know, um, I'd have a taxi driver once in a while who spoke a little bit of English. And they would tell us how Muslims, and this was in southern Spain. So this was sort of the last fort as the Muslims were being pushed. Right? They got pushed into southern Spain and then finally that was it. There was no more. Any, any Spanish Muslim today happens to be either a Moroccan Muslim or a convert. There's no Spanish Muslim that actually remained Muslims. Right? That they con the, the Islam continued. It was actually cut off. And you see Masajid today right? that have been converted into churches. There's no, it's no longer there. Right? So we can build, and these are big beautiful places. You can have all the buildings that you want. But if we don't have that spiritual infrastructure inside the masjid, if we don't have that community building inside the masjid, if we don't have love for each other inside the masjid, if we don't make room for our women and children inside the masjid, then it's all useless. These will be nothing but empty buildings. Now, subhanAllah, I was mentioning this yesterday over lunch. It was actually kind of cool that, the, you know, that I actually went to Spain <clears throat> and then the summer after I went to Turkey. And all of a sudden, I kind of felt happy. Because that one year, I was very sad. I was, in fact, the, the, the town, I was in a town... I can't remember where I was. Um, I happened to be in a small outside a small village. And every time we drive by the village, Lord behold, there was always someone that would remind me that 4,000 Muslims were killed in this village in one day. Right? 4,000 Muslims were killed in this village. And these villages are very, very old villages. Right? And that they were killed, they were massacred, they were butchered. And so I would, I would cry and I would feel sad. And, you know, the, uh, and subhanAllah, the way they did it. And then the year after, last summer I, I was in Turkey. So I kind of felt happy, subhanAllah. You know, Islam is, it's, if you haven't been to Turkey, go to Turkey. Yeah, I, Turkey, Turkish government, the Turkish government should start paying me now. I have sent so many people to Turkey in the last year and a half. Yeah. Um, go to Turkey. It's a beautiful place. It's an amazing place. You know, Islam has just come back to life. Islam has just come back. You gotta believe. When Erdogan, I'll tell you a story. Erdogan, the current prime minister, he was the mayor of Istanbul. When he became the mayor of Istanbul, there was no water. There was no rain in Istanbul. And what they used to do is they used to transport water in trucks to Istanbul. Uh, absolutely no rain for a few years. And when Erdogan became the mayor, he said that we're going to pray Salatul Istisqa. And this was a few years ago, right? And people started making fun of him. The liberals started making fun of him. So look at this person talking about religion, right? And there was no talk of religion in Turkey for years, for decades. And they say, SubhanAllah, he said, fine, if you want to pray, you can pray. If you don't want to pray, you don't have to pray. But this is what we're going to do. They went out, they prayed Salatul Istisqa, and they say within a few days rain came down. Right? Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The masajid are alive. And one other thing I generally, I mention this generally at fundraisers, that in Muslim countries, the infrastructure is already there. The masajid are already built. The community centers already exist. The awqaf already exist. The money is already there. People just need to think of a project, the money comes through, it just gets taken care of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the opportunity in the West to actually create, create that infrastructure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants our money and wants our time. We're being blessed. These are things, if many of us, many of us that are active in this country as Muslims in our local masajid and community centers, if you happen to be back home in the lands that you came from, you probably wouldn't have had this opportunity to donate or to spend this much time doing the work fi sabilillah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so having your heart and this is it this is this is you know this is home your masjid is your home your masjid is your community 
I've lived in San Jose for 30 years. In, in two months, I'll have been in San Jose for 30 years, which is most of my life. And um, I, tell, I sometimes tell people, you know, uh, for those of you that don't know, I actually interviewed here. I've been reminded of it time and again. I interviewed at this message in 2005. Um, <laughs> my, my rizq was not meant to be here. Um, and I, I, uh, may Allah bless the individuals here, they actually gave me a job offer and I, I did not accept it. Um, my risk was meant to be in California. But I tell people that my friends in California are closer to me than most of my cousins. My friends that I made at the masjid are closer to me than most of my cousins. Today some of my best friends happen to be people I met at the masjid. The people that I go for hajj with year after year, sometimes the same individual, some of my students, some of my friends, are people I met at the masjid. These are people who are not of my nationality. These are not people who share the same color as my skin, but these are my best friends. And yesterday when Sheikh Yasir mentioned that, you know, can, do you have 10 people that you would trust your life with? And as I went through that list of 10 people, there were many people who were not of my background in terms of my ethnicity. That is what you call love, and that all begins at the masjid. So, Rajulun Qalbuhu Mu'allakum Bil Masjid. And finally, and I know it's time for Isha, so I probably won't have a lot of time, but I do want to end. Rajulun Tasaddaqa Bi Sadaqatin Fa'akhfaha Hatta La Ta'lam Shimaluhu Ma Tunfiq Yameenu. A person gives in charity and is so quiet and is so silent, is so humble, is so sincere in their charity that even that person's left hand doesn't know what the right hand gave. And this was the action of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the action of the greatest that have passed. Right? The great people, great people don't talk about their greatness. Great people don't need to talk about their greatness. Right? Rich people, they have bills. Okay? They don't make noise. All the people that have change in their pockets, they're the ones that make noise. Right? They're the ones that make noise. I, I learned this example, I was in Lisbon many years ago and I happened to be driving into the parking lot of, of the largest masjid in Lisbon and uh, a person showed up, I still remember it was a beat up Honda Accord. I'm a car person so I kind of remember those things. Uh, beat up Honda Accord and the person that I was with told me that this happens to be the richest Muslim in all of Portugal and you couldn't tell. Right? This person owned about a dozen hotels, number of businesses. You just couldn't tell. That's why great people, they don't, you know, their greatness is hidden. And that's what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us through this example. To be as sincere as possible. And this is something that we need to just, you know, understand. When we do, you know, sometimes we do things to encourage others. Sometimes we do things to help others and encourage them, bring them along. You know, you do something, you post it on Facebook in this Asian era of Facebook. Right? Everything, every good, I tell people, don't post every good thing that you do on Facebook, especially for the young. Your rewards are decreased. If you have this sense of being better, betterment, better than someone else, or this sense of arrogance, your reward has been taken away. There are times when we should, in fact, all of our actions should be only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If once in a while we share some of those things with others to encourage them to join, then it's understandable. But before you post a posting on Facebook, you know, ask yourself, am I really doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or by posting this, am I actually showing off just a little that, hey, look how Islamic I am. You know, I'll make a good wife. I'll make a good husband. You know, marry me. Not directly, but indirectly. Sometimes I, I, I you, know, you know when you delete files on computers, they ask you, are you sure? I sometimes feel that when you post a post on Facebook, before you hit post, there should be a button that pops up and says, uh, you know, are you sure? You know what I'm saying? And you have to think about it before you actually hit just post. Right? But being sincere, and now let's, let's understand this. What is sincerity? Since sometimes we do things, as I mentioned, to, you know, encourage others. And sometimes we do it to show others, hey, look, you know, I can be a good person too. But the heart in al qalba bayna usbu'i rahman The heart is, you know, in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we do everything solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will change people's hearts towards us. We won't have to do that. And that's the belief we need to have. You want to be called generous? Sometimes people want, you know, they say they want to show their generosity. 
right? And so that people would call them generous. They want, and there's sometimes it, there's some, you know, it's okay depending on the conditions and so on and so forth. But if we do everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Right? And we do it so much for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't want any re- recognition. Sometimes people, and this is very deep, sometimes we do things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we expect that Allah will make people nice towards me, then you're not sincere in and of itself. The extreme level of sincerity is I'm doing this solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether Allah exposes my niceness, kindness to others or not. As long as Allah knows I've done it, that's the end. That's all that matters. And even after that, if people make fun of you or do things to you or say things about you, that's okay because you did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Masjid volunteers, don't expect any thanks from people. Right? Continue doing what you're doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether you get, you know, and this is, this is something, uh, you know, in my masjid as well, we have this, this goes, this is all around. You know, I tell people, when someone does something good, don't send any thank you emails. Right? Thank, a thank you email is so cheap these days. It is so ridiculous. You know, and of course you could argue with me and say, no, you, you need to encourage people, brother. You know, I tell you simply, thank you. It, we're, not even, we're not even sincere in our thank you email. We're doing it so that that person feels, oh look this person said thank you to me. What's the level of our sincerity? Sometimes you know, we, I just feel that we need an entire class on sincerity. What sincerity really is. And deep down how sincere, you know, how can we be as sincere as possible? For That's what it comes down to. We, although there's great rewards in charity and this, this, this hadith is specifically about charity, but we can draw examples of sincerity from this as well. Right? We can draw examples of sincerity from this as well. That you're doing it for the sake, well, you know, our, my job is to do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, I tell people that if in our good works, if in our good works, there's arrogance that comes into us, or pride that comes into us, or we become volume, we start taking away the rights of other individuals, stop doing what you're doing. Because it's detrimental. Right? It's detrimental. You meet someone really nice, happily, you're hugging them, saying salamu alaikum to them in public, but behind them you're talking about them. Right? You're, you're, doing, you're writing things behind, about them behind their back. Masjid volunteers, friends, family members. You're in public, oh, assalamu alaikum brother, how are you? Alhamdulillah. And then you go home and said, Ismail was at the masjid today. Why did he show up at the masjid? He shouldn't be coming here. Didn't we tell him not to come? They, they, I mean, really, what, what, why are we doing all of this? Right? Our hearts really need to be clean, everything. Now, when we talk about charity, now I understand people who are on the fundraising committee of, the, of this masjid would probably want that when you give charity, other people know that you gave charity so that you know, people would join in as well. And I understand there's part, that's perfectly fine. But sometimes like, there, needs to be, there, needs, there need to be times when you just do it just between you and Allah. Just between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if our hearts are in the right place, Allah facilitates everything. Allah facil- you know, there's an individual that I know, and he's, a, he's an amazing donor. He continues to donate, and he continues to donate. One of the largest donors. And when he comes to any gathering, his condition is that I not be acknowledged at all. I'll sit where I want to sit. I'll sit with who I want to sit, and my name never be mentioned, ever. Ever. He go- and this is what he believes. He says that Allah has given me wealth, and he's very wealthy. Okay, he's very wealthy. He says, Allah has, he goes, I don't need all this wealth. This is his, this, he says, I don't need all this wealth. In order for me to survive, if I just have a portion of what Allah has given to me, I will survive. As far as my children, Allah has sent them into this dunya with their rizq. I don't need to do anything for them. Their rizq is with them. Okay? Allah will look after them. وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا Right, their rizq is with them. So all the rest of the wealth that I have, Allah has given it to me to give. Now don't ask me who that person is. I don't want anyone knocking on my door and say, Brother, can you introduce us to that, to that brother? <laughs> you know, he, he, that's, he firmly believes this. That Allah has given me this, given me wealth to distribute. And I will end with one thing. People don't give because they're rich. People don't give because they're rich. They're actually rich because they give. 
Okay, people don't give because they're rich. There's a lot of rich that can't give. It's usually the poor that give. It's the middle class. Any masjid fundraising committee will tell you that the bulk of the dollars come through the middle class people. Okay, I, no, I don't want to be mean to the wealthy people of this community. Your $100,000 checks definitely help us. Please continue with those. May Allah reward you and grant us all sincerity and tawfiq. But that said, right, that's a, we, we, we must acknowledge this. That we're not, we're not, we're not rich. We're not, we're, we don't give because we're rich. We're actually rich because we give. And so Nabi Sallallahu reminds us, رَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقًا And gives charity. No one knows what you gave. Right? And, and the example he gives are the two hands. The two hands are so close to each other. In fact, you actually need two hands to give. If you're going to pull out your wallet, you can't do everything with one hand. You're going to need your other hand to open your wallet, hold the wallet, while the one hand pulls out the $100 bill or the $500 bill, you know, and close it and put it inside. The other hand, but what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is telling us to be so secretive, to be so secretive and give. Right? And that's, that's, the beauty, uh, that's the beauty of Islam. That's the beauty of who we are, to be as sincere and do everything for the... And that's why, because... Allah will never disappoint. Human beings will disappoint us. If we put our trust in human beings, my time is up, is it time for Isha? Human beings, it is time for Isha. I'll, I'll end with this. Human beings will disappoint us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never disappoint us. So put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of individuals who fit into all three of these categories. In fact, all seven of the categories. Ameen ya rabbal alameen bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimeen. As far as the quiz, we could probably do it after Aisha, inshaAllah. Yeah.